Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Irfan Ahmed. I'm on the National Muni Ahmed team. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about the Nuclear Disaster Preparedness and Evacuation Plan. Okay, so before we get into the plan, uh, I just want to talk about nuclear bombs and nuclear explosions to provide some sort of context as to what we're dealing with exactly. So this slide here um, is an overview of all the countries in the world that have nuclear weapons. And as you can see, the U.S. and Russia lead the world um, in terms of both active and inactive weapons. So an important thing to note here is that the U.S. and Russia are the only two countries that have uh, deployed warheads, meaning that they're installed on missiles or on bases and they're ready to go, whereas the rest of the world has warheads that are um, assigned to, uh, they're, they're in inventory and they're assigned for potential use. They might not be ready to go. So another important thing to note is the number of warheads that uh, the U.S. and Russia have that are retired. So this means that these weapons, they still pose a threat. Um, they still require safe handling, storage, and they still need to be secured while they sit in storage. Uh, the U.S. keeps warheads all over the all over the world, as you see on the slide here. So all in all, uh, there's a lot of nuclear warheads, uh, both active and inactive, retired. They're ready and on standby, uh, ready or on standby, and they're sprinkled all over the world. So in order to prep for a nuclear explosion, uh, we need to understand what exactly happens during a nuclear explosion. So it consists of three main parts. There's the, uh, the thermal portion of it, thermal radiation, there's the, the blast or the overpressure, and there's the fallout. Uh, the release of thermal energy in a nuclear explosion, that's the main difference between a nuclear explosion and a conventional explosion. In a conventional explosion, you'd have the majority of the energy just being uh, the blast and very little, almost none, being a thermal portion. So the flash is the first thing you'd see during a nuclear explosion. Um, this is followed by that thermal radiation traveling at the speed of light. So this release of thermal energy uh, will burn your eyes, will burn your skin, as well as any combustible materials that are, it's, that are in the way. So think of it, in, uh, so imagine a, a wave of energy that just burns everything that, that it crosses. So after that, you've got the blast, the shock wave. So roughly half of the energy in a nuclear explosion is the blast. Um, it travels at the speed of sound. The units for measuring the blast are in... Um, PSI of overpressure. So, so about five PSI of overpressure is enough to level a house. So now imagine a wave of energy that can level anything in its path. So, so as the fireball grows, it cools and forms that mushroom cloud that um, we, you know, we've all seen uh, in, on TV. So that mushroom cloud sucks up any dirt and debris from the flash and the blast and it rains back down to the earth and this is called fallout. So how far the fallout travels really depends upon the winds and the weather conditions in the area at the time of the blast, but you can expect that fallout to travel for miles. So the, radio, the, 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 the material in the fallout is radioactive and depending upon how much your body is exposed to that material, it's gonna, depend, it's gonna determine how damaging that fallout is gonna be to your health. So EMPs, EMPs are the first thing that happens during a, uh, a nuclear explosion. They're hard to understand. So I'm going to try to understand it the way that I understand how an EMP works. So think of it similar to a lightning strike. So a lightning strike basically is a spike in voltage caused by positive and negative charges in the atmosphere. But in, in this case, uh, these charges separate and that creates an electric field uh, in the atmosphere. And then that field couples in with the Earth's magnetic field. And then this electromagnetic field then radiates into electrical circuits creating an electrical current. And so depending upon the design of the electrical components, um, depending upon the design of those components, it'll be able to handle that um, surge or it won't. And so it'll potentially, the EMP will potentially damage uh, electrical components, which could you know, essentially cripple all your communications and everything electrical, electrical components even before, um, you know, you'd have a chance to, to react to it. All right, so this next slide shows a comparison of different bomb types. And so Reuters did an article 
a while ago about how powerful the Beirut blast was. So if you recall, the Beirut blast was a chemical fertilizer explosion. So it was chemical fertilizer that was being improperly stored and then exploded. So they show the explosion uh, yield in tons of TNT. So it's interesting when you compare well-known conventional explosions like the Hellfire or the Tomahawk missiles to nuclear explosions like Chernobyl or Hiroshima. So whereas uh, a Tomahawk missile is the equivalent of half a ton of TNT, Chernobyl was the equivalent of 10 tons of TNT, and Hiroshima was the equivalent of 15 kilotons or 15,000 tons of TNT. So the next chart shows uh, the comparison of nuclear explosions. So now you can see that the numbers get much bigger. So as we saw the jump from Chernobyl of 10 tons to Hiroshima of 15,000 tons, now look at Hiroshima compare, compared to Sarbamba. So you're looking at 15 kiloton explosion compared to 50 megaton explosion. So Sarbamba was the largest ever nuclear explosion in history. It was conducted by the Soviet Union in the early 60s to show off their nuclear capabilities. But if you look at the size of that mushroom cloud, it's 59 miles wide, it's 42 miles up in the sky. Uh, the last image here is the nuke map. So uh, you can go to this website and um, it shows you how far a nuclear explosion would travel. So you can set certain parameters like the location. You can do a pin drop, set the location, the size of the explosion, the burst type, and you can see how far the effects would travel. So it shows you how far the flash, the, sh the, the shock wave, and the fallout would travel. So in this case, I placed Sarbamba in the heart of downtown Chicago, so in the loop. And then you can see how far the effects of the, uh, the flash, the shock wave, and the fallout how far they reached and so in this case they you know they go all the way up to Zion which is about an hour or from about 50 miles away from downtown Chicago okay so on this next slide here uh, you can find this PDF uh, at ready.gov it's a good PDF but I don't fully agree with everything it says it gives you the impression that um, you can survive a nuclear event ultimately your survival is going to depend upon how close you are to the epicenter and how much notice you have and how you know how much notice you have to take cover uh, or to evacuate so depending upon where you are relative to where the explosion happened you might not be able to do anything at all so you might die along with thousands of other people so but let's break it down and see what you can do um, so the EMP uh, the EMP has no effect on the human body so in my opinion it's not a huge factor yes it'll affect it'll cripple electrical devices but uh, I mean, you should already be expecting that to happen. So for the, for the remaining three, the best case scenario is that you get into a concrete structure underground. So this way you won't be affected by the thermal energy of the flash or the destruction of the shock wave or even the harmful radiation from the fallout. But nevertheless, uh, try to take cover the best you can. Look for concrete structures uh, or bricks since they'll protect you from that thermal energy during the flash and they can protect you better than a wooden structure from the shock wave. Um, a wooden structure has the potential of catching fire from that thermal uh, energy, from that release of thermal energy, and it can't withstand as much um, overpressure as a masonry structure. So you basically want to get to the center of the building, get away from any windows. If you can go underground, that's best go underground and you'll be safe from the fallout so look for a basement or subway tunnels uh, the radiation initially uh, will drop quite a bit from uh, the initial event so uh, it might take a couple weeks before it drops completely uh, before it's safe enough to uh, to go out but <clears throat> the slide says stay tuned uh, and that cellular and internet communication will be disrupted but couple things there might not be anything to stay tuned to depending upon how big this blast is and you can pretty much guarantee that you, you won't be able to rely, rely on any cellular or internet communication if something like this was to happen so like I said in our last call um, in the event of a nuclear explosion all bets are off your plans are all going to change so it's best that you you plan and you have a, a backup plan for your backup plan okay so the next slide here uh, we talk about the uh, supply list items, supply lists and items. So there's many lists that are out there. Um, everyone has a list. Abude has got one, the Red Cross, FEMA. All these lists are very much the same. They all have something 
for food, water, for shelter, first aid, personal hygiene. And for the most part, you can buy all these items online. The point isn't to get stuck looking for the purpose, perfect list with all the Amazon links to, for easy ordering. The point is find a list and start stocking up. Stock up your shelter in place items, stock up your go bag items. Now the nuclear specific items are gonna be something like a radiation tester or a Geiger counter. So this is a device that measures radiation levels so you know um, if an area is, has unsafe uh, levels of radiation. Potassium iodine pills are used uh, to give your thyroid a, bo a boost, so your thyroid is very susceptible to the effects of radiation. And then the anti-radiation homeopathy pills that Hazur has suggested, um, these should also be in your, um, in your kit. These will help protect against the ill effects of radiation. Now, hazmat suit, I, I didn't put a hazmat suit in this list because I, they don't provide any protection against radiation. So no matter how airtight the suit is, the radiation is going to penetrate it unless if the suit's made of lead. So the best thing to, to do would be is to measure the radiation with the Geiger counter and then avoid areas with high radiation. Now, I've never used a Geiger counter before, so if anyone who's watching this has used one, uh, please share the, the knowledge and let us know. Uh, the important thing is, is that we should stick together as a community, work as a team, share information, because we're obviously we're stronger in numbers. Um, ask questions, do your own research, even question the information that I'm giving you today. And if you've got a better idea, feel free to share, but don't share any uh, misleading information or any unverified information. So think before you um, share anything or forward anything out. So the, uh, the Muriama evacuation plan, um, the plan is basically to evacuate a group of people to a remote location. That's essentially what we're trying to do. So in the perfect world, we'd have ample notice, we'd have clear instructions on where to go, when to go, um, but it's never gonna be that clear and you're just gonna have to uh, improvise along the way. So to start out, start building, uh, so, so, so to start building your plan, uh, first, identify any land that your might might have your, your jamaat might have access to. This could be land that your jamaat members might have, or you could identify some potential public lands where you could evacuate to. Next, you want to identify members in your jamaat who have experience with evacuating. So, if there's any members who have evacuated or fled their homes due to civil war, or civil unrest, um, you know, members who might know how to camp, hunt, or fish members who are mechanically inclined, uh, people who can administer medical aid, people who can cook, people who can build things. I mean, the more diverse your team is, the stronger it's gonna be. And, you know, we're stronger in numbers, so. But once you've got the land identified and your team identified, we need to execute a dry run. So evacuate to the land, see what works, see what didn't work, make changes as needed. Um, get out of the habit of communicating on your cell phones. Use CB radios, ham radios, two-way radios. Um, use your car as a shelter. Keep the car fueled up. Um, encourage members to build their own survival kits, um, per, you know, their own personal kits in their own houses. So the, uh, the, the Amuriyama evacuation plan should just be one part, uh, one, uh, one, one layer of the disaster prep, prep plans that you already have. And depending on the emergency, you'd use a different plan. So this is a plan you could use not only for a nuclear evacuation, but for any evacuation. This plan could be used for evacuation during a civil war, civil unrest, trying to evacuate any unsafe condition. You know, what we, what we see happening in Gaza is nothing new. Um, you know, people being forced to evacuate has happened throughout history where people are forced to leave, flee due to war. Um, and it can happen anywhere in the world. Just because we're in the United States doesn't mean we're safe. Again, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Have a backup plan for your backup plan. And this concludes the presentation. Assalamu alaikum